You are listening to Slaughter in Shangri-La, the British Invasion of Tibet, written and narrated by Mark Felton. This is an audio episode. Tibet. The name conjures up images of Mount Everest, Buddhist monasteries perched atop snowy precipices, the rhythmic chanting of saffron-robed monks, a mysterious Shangri-La hidden at the top of the earth, inaccessible, unknowable and elusive. Just two years after the successful conclusion of the campaign to eradicate the boxers in China, Britain found herself at war once again in China. But this war was to be unlike all the other wars Britain had waged against the Celestial Empire. For this war was fought on the periphery of the Qing Empire. It was also a war that was fought not for opium, or indeed for any kind of trade or territorial benefit, but to keep another powerful empire out of the British sphere of influence. The campaign was led by one of the British Empire's greatest explorers, who took British and Indian troops to the highest landmass on earth, the Himalayas. The Chinese had first gained control of large areas of what is now modern Tibet between 1724 and 1728. The Qing dynasty established a resident commissioner, or Amban, in Lhasa, and in 1750 had ruthlessly crushed the Tibetan rebellion. The Amban closely advised the religious ruler of Tibet, the Dalai Lama. In 1792, the Chinese successfully ejected a Nepalese invasion of Tibet, and afterwards established garrisons along the border with Tibet's Himalayan neighbour. Tibet was not, however, made a province of China. In 1834, the mighty Sikh Empire invaded and annexed the Kingdom of Ladakh, a culturally Tibetan region that adjoins Tibet. Then, in 1841, the Sikhs invaded Tibet proper, but a joint Chinese-Tibetan army threw them out. As the 19th century progressed, the Qing dynasty became progressively weaker and her control over Tibet weakened until it became virtually symbolic. Britain's most geographically extreme war was an extension of the Great Game, the diplomatic and espionage tug of war between London and St. Petersburg. Here it would be played out in the High Himalayas. The British administration in India rightly feared Russian expansion south. China, and by default Tibet, was one area where such an expansion of Tsarism appeared probable by the early 20th century. Rumours abounded in India that the Chinese were planning to gift Tibet to Russia as part of a strategic realignment. If this were to happen, one of the buffer states that kept the Russians out of India would be eliminated, the other buffer states being Afghanistan, Nepal, Sikkim and Bhutan. Many British colonial administrators felt that the close relations employed by Tsar Nicholas II's representative and the 13th Dalai Lama at the Potala Palace in Lhasa had lent credence to their hypothesis. Also, a Russian explorer had actually been the first European to live in Lhasa in 1900. In 1903, the Viceroy of India, Viscount Curzon, keen to extend British influence into Tibet, proposed to the Chinese and Tibetan authorities that their envoys should meet with British representatives at Kampa Tsong, a village just north of the Sikkim border, to discuss trade. The Chinese ordered the Dalai Lama to attend, but he refused, and also refused to provide porters and transport to move the Chinese Amban to the meeting place. Curzon instructed Major Francis Young Husband to lead an expedition to Kampa Tsong. Young Husband was born to a British military family in India in 1863. After the Royal Military College Sandhurst, he was commissioned into the 1st King's Dragoon Guards in 1882. His first Asian expedition was made in 1886-87, to when he was on leave from his regiment in India. Young Husband explored Manchuria's Changbai Mountains, crossed the Gobi Desert to Chinese Turkestan, now Xinjiang Province in China, and charted a route from Kashgar to India. 
These formidable achievements led to his election as the youngest member of the Royal Geographical Society and the award of the Society's Gold Medal. As a captain in 1889, young husband with a small escort of Gurkhas had chartered Ladakh, the territory that bordered Tibet, and the Karakoram. In 1890, Major Young Husband was seconded from the army to the Indian Civil Service as a political officer. In July 1903, Young Husband arrived at Gangtok, Sikkim. British policy had shifted from trying to entice the Tibetans into trade to attempting to provoke a war that would lead to a British victory and the right to establish diplomatic and trade missions in Lhasa and end once and for all all Russian influence in the country. Young Husband and the expedition's military commander, Lieutenant Colonel Herbert Brander, searched for a pretext to enter Tibet and discovered one when some Tibetan yaks drifted over the border. Young Husband branded the yak invasion Tibetan hostility and in August 1903 crossed the border in force. Based at Kampa Tsong, Tsong meaning fort, Young Husband's force consisted of 3,000 fighting men, plus over 10,000 Sherpas, porters and camp followers. Young Husband assumed the post of British Commissioner to Tibet, while Brigadier General James MacDonald was to lead the enlarged military expedition. Under his command, MacDonald had the best high-altitude troops that the British Indian Army could provide. He also had plenty of modern firepower that was to be used to lethal effect. For the invasion of Tibet, Young Husband and MacDonald took with them 1,150 men, consisting of eight companies of the 23rd Sikh Pioneers and a half company of the Madras Sappers and Miners. There were six companies of the 8th Gurkha Rifles. A Maxim gun detachment from the Norfolk Regiment provided support, along with two 7-pounder guns manned by Gurkhas and two 10-pounder guns of the 7th Mountain Battery Royal Garrison Artillery. The Tibetans were keen to avoid a war with the world's largest superpower. Their own armed forces consisted of a medieval army armed with swords, spears and ancient matchlock muskets. Its soldiers were brave, but no match for machine guns, modern rifles and artillery. The Tibetan general commanding forces at Yadong sent a message to MacDonald stating that he would not attack the British if they did not attack him. Young Husband replied on the 6th of December 1903, quote, We are not at war with Tibet, and that unless we ourselves attacked, we shall not attack the Tibetans, unquote. But, although Young Husband's army had been encamped at Kampar Tsong for months, no Tibetan officials had come to talk. Sitting still for several months at such an altitude and under extreme weather conditions inevitably cost lives. We had 12 cases of pneumonia among these sepoys, wrote Young Husband of his mostly Indian force, 11 of which, from the altitude, proved fatal and one poor young fellow in the postal department, Mr. Lewis, had to have both of his feet amputated for frostbite and eventually died of the effects. But in true imperial style, the mission to Lhasa was not only a military one, it was also one of exploration and discovery. Captain Ryder would go off surveying, recalled young husband. Mr. Hayden would make geologizing expeditions. Captain Walton would collect every living animal of any size and description he would detect. Captain O'Connor would always be surrounded by Tibetans of every degree of dirt. Young husband was in his element, commenting that the natural scenery was an unfailing pleasure. Tibet was an extraordinarily beautiful place that deeply affected many of the British officers who were sent to campaign there. Their memoirs are full of vivid descriptions of the landscape and its people. In April 1904, young husband decided to advance his force 50 miles to Tuna, knowing full well that the Tibetans would have no choice but to resist. We moved along as rapidly as possible at those high altitudes and encumbered with heavy clothing, noted young husband. The cold was intense. On the 4th of April, the Tibetans made their first attempt to stop the British advance on Lhasa at Chumik Shenko, with catastrophic results. Quote, 
A short way out, we were met by a messenger from the Tibetan general, urging us to go back to India. I told the messenger to gallop back at once and tell the Lhasa general that we were on our way to Gyantse, and we were going as far as Guru, ten miles distant, that day. I said that we did not want to fight, and would not unless we were opposed, and that the road must be left clear for us, and the Tibetans must withdraw from their positions across it." Unquote. The British force advanced across a gravelly plain, and halted a thousand yards from the Tibetan defences. Facing young husband and MacDonald, at the high Himalayan pass of Chumik Shenko, were three thousand Tibetan troops, who were dug in behind a five-foot-high rock wall. On the scree slope behind and above the wall were eight stone bunkers, or sangers. The Tibetan general rode out to meet the British force, having first ordered his men to extinguish their musket fuses. Lighting them again would be a laborious and time-consuming process. The Tibetans' apparently peaceful gesture rendered useless his men's firearms at the critical moment. They rode up briskly with a little cavalcade, recalled young husband. We all dismounted, set out rugs and coats on the ground, and sat down for the final discussion. Young husband reiterated his previous arguments, but the Tibetan general virtually ordered the British to return to Kampa Tsong and to negotiate from there. There was no possible reasoning with such people, wrote young husband. They had such overweening confidence in their lama's powers. How could anyone dare to resist the orders of the great lama? Surely lightning would descend from heaven, or the earth open up and destroy anyone who had such temerity. Young husband explained that he had waited for Tibetan envoys for eight months, to no avail, and all of his letters had gone unanswered, so that he was under orders to advance to Gyantse. The Tibetans were given fifteen minutes to decide whether or not to resist the British advance. Young husband was deeply frustrated by the Tibetans' strong belief in the Dalai Lama and in their religious charms. Quote, We might just as well have spoken to a stone wall, not the very slightest effect was produced. After all, our numbers were not very overwhelming. The Tibetans had charms against our bullets and the supernatural powers of the great lama in the background. Unquote. The British officers noticed that the Tibetans had failed to fortify the western side of the great mountain pass, leaving them exposed to a flanking move. Young husband was later at pains to state that he and MacDonald flew in the face of military logic and gave the Tibetans repeated chances to back down, knowing full well that the British could have destroyed the Tibetan forces at any time. Instead, young husband risked his men's lives by ordering them to approach the Tibetan positions across completely open ground and shoulder the Tibetans out of their positions without opening fire. Quote, the Tibetans on their side showed great indecision. They also had apparently received orders not to fire first, and the whole affair seemed likely to end in comedy rather than in the tragedy which actually followed. Unquote. After the Indian troops had removed most of the Tibetans from their positions, a change of heart occurred. The Tibetans began returning to their positions, and they would not leave the wall. They were huddled together like a flock of sheep behind the wall, noted young husband. Our infantry were in position on the hillside, only twenty yards above them on the one side. On the other, our maxims and guns were trained upon them at not two hundred yards distance. Our mounted infantry were in readiness in the plain a quarter of a mile away. The Tibetan general and his staff remained on the British side of the wall, mingled in with these sepoys. Young husband and General MacDonald conferred, and decided to order the disarming of the Tibetan soldiers. I sent Captain O'Connor to announce to the Tibetan general that General MacDonald and I had decided that his men must be disarmed, recalled young husband, but he remained sullen and did nothing. Young husband forcefully maintained that it was the Tibetan general who fired first. After a pause, the disarmament was actually commenced. The Tibetan general threw himself upon his sepoy, drew a revolver, and shot the sepoy in the jaw. All hell now broke loose. Not, I think, with any deliberate intention, but from sheer insanity, the signal had now been given, wrote young husband. 
Other Tibetan shots immediately followed. Simultaneous volleys from our own troops rang out. The guns and maxims commenced to fire. The fighting was at very close quarters for the first few minutes. Tibetan swordsmen made a rush upon any within reach, and the plucky and enterprising Edmund Candler, the very able correspondent of the Daily Mail, received more than a dozen wounds, while Major Wallace Dunlop, one of the best officers in the force, was severely handled, wrote young husband. When the fighting broke out, the Tibetans, with their greater numbers, posed a serious threat to the British troops. For just one single instant, the Tibetans, by a concerted and concentrated rush, might have broken our own thin line and have carried the mission and the military staff, recalled young husband. But that instant passed in a flash. Before a few seconds were over, guns and rifles were dealing the deadliest destruction on them in their huddled masses. The Tibetan general was among the first to die. Rifle fire crackled along the British front ranks, while the Norfolk's Maxim guns hammered out lines of bullets that cut down hundreds. The Tibetans bravely refused to run away, and instead they retreated slowly back down the pass with their fronts to the British, huge numbers of their men falling dead and wounded as they went. When the British sent in a cavalry troop, the Tibetans fixed bayonets and bravely repulsed them before they reached shelter half a mile from the wall. I got so sick of the slaughter that I ceased fire, though the general's order was to make as big a bag as possible, wrote Lieutenant Arthur Haddow, commanding MacDonald's machine gun detachment from the Norfolk Regiment. I hope I shall never have to shoot down men walking away, he added in disgust. The plain was strewn with dead Tibetans, and our troops instantly and without direct orders ceased firing though in fact they had only fired 13 rounds per man, wrote young husband. Tibetan casualties amounted to between 600 and 700 dead, with 168 counted wounded. British casualties echoed the one-sided victories of the Opium Wars in China, just 12 wounded. After the action, General MacDonald ordered the whole of the medical staff to attend the wounded Tibetans wrote young husband. Everything that with our limited means we could do for them was done. Captains Davies, Walton, Baird, Franklin and Kelly devoted themselves to their care. A rough hospital was made at Tuna. It was a terrible and ghastly business, said young husband. But it was not fair for an English statesman to call it a massacre of unarmed men, for photographs testify that the Tibetans were all armed, and looking back now, I do not see how it could possibly have been avoided. Young husband placed the blame for the high death toll squarely on the Dalai Lama. Ignorant and arrogant, this priest herded the superstitious peasantry to destruction, he wrote. Young husband felt that the slaughter, though a terrible thing, would serve a useful purpose in convincing the Dalai Lama to submit to negotiations. Writing to Lord Curzon in India, young husband stated, I trust the tremendous punishment they have received will prevent further fighting and induce them at last to negotiate. In this, young husband was to be sorely disabused, for although profoundly shocked by the events of the 4th of April, the Dalai Lama did not immediately order peace envoys to be sent out. Tibetan politics were those of drift, wrote young husband. The Chinese officials were too engrossed in self-seeking and hence the Tibetans shirked action. The day after the fighting, a 2,000-man Tibetan force retreated without engaging the British, and young husband resumed his march to Gyantse. The fort at Gyantse was one of the most astounding sights in all Tibet. Gyantse has two principal features, wrote young husband, the Tsong and the monastery, called Palkor Choidi. The Zong is a really imposing structure built of strong, solid masonry and rising in tiers of walls up to a rocky eminence springing abruptly out of the plain to a height of 400 or 500 feet. It has the most commanding and dominant look. The fort was originally constructed in 1390. Its lofty position completely dominated the surrounding area and the route to Lhasa. The monastery immediately adjoining it at the part of the base of the hill is also impressive from the height and solidity of the walls with which it is surrounded and by the massiveness of the buildings within the walls, noted young husband. 
Some important buildings near the Tsong were taken by British troops, and the defensive posture maintained, though the mighty Tsong itself remained unconquered. The demeanor of the inhabitants was respectful, noted young husband of the citizens of Gyanse town. The people said they had not the slightest wish to fight us, and only desired to escape being commandeered by the Lhasa authorities. But the Tibetans' dilatory tactics continued to irritate young husband. On the 22nd of April, he sent a message to India suggesting that the best remedy for such tactics was to move the mission to Lhasa and carry on negotiations directly with the Dalai Lama in the capital and not from halfway at Gyanse. Our prestige, I urged, was then at its height. Nepal and Bhutan were with us, the people were not against us, the Tibetan soldiers did not care to fight, the Lamas were stunned. By a decisive move, a permanent settlement could be procured, wrote Young Husband. However, just two days after Young Husband had sent this message to Lord Curzon, rumours arrived in Gyanse the Tibetans were gathering military forces again that they were building defensive walls across the road at Karola Pass, blocking the way to Lhasa, and had established camps containing between 700 and 800 soldiers there. Lieutenant Colonel Brander, in command of the mission escort, with 500 men, two artillery guns, two Maxims, and some mounted infantry, left on the 28th of April to find out if the rumours were true. One company of mounted infantry, under the command of Captain Hodgson, was sent to reconnoitre the 16,000-foot-high Karala Pass. On the 1st of May, Hodgson sent word that three miles beyond the pass he had encountered a wall stretching for 600 yards across the valley. This obstacle was defended by 1,000 to 1,500 heavily armed Tibetans, who opened a strong fire the moment Hodgson's company approached them. After returning fire, Hodgson retired to Gyanse. Further reports reached young husband that Tibetan troops were assembling in the Rong Valley and at Shigatse. It seemed clear that the Dalai Lama was not prepared to allow the British to enter Lhasa easily. Branda asked permission to attack the Tibetans before things came to a head. He had much frontier experience, noted young husband, and I also had some and we both of us knew that when such gatherings take place, it is a pretty sound general principle to take the initiative and hit them hard before they have time to accumulate overwhelming strength. Brander would take with him two-thirds of the British force, leaving Major Murray of the 8th Gurkha Rifles in command of the remaining third at Gyanse. Karala Pass was 45 miles from Gyanse. If Gyanse was attacked in force, there were doubts that the small number of troops remaining could hold it, and if it fell, Brander's force would be trapped behind enemy forces with his supply lines cut. But young husband and the other officers knew that they could not leave the Tibetans in control of Karala and nearby Kangma as they threatened the British lines of communication. Young husband informed Lord Curzon of the expedition and also sent a message to the Chinese and Tibetans that the British were there to negotiate and not to fight. There could be no question then that we meant to negotiate and not to fight, wrote young husband, yet they still neither sent a negotiator nor said they had any intention to negotiate. Instead, they massed troops to attack us. Brander's assault was given the green light to proceed. Branda left Gyanse on the 3rd of May with three companies from the 32nd Sikh Pioneers, one company from the 8th Gurkhas, two 7-pounder field guns and two Maxim machine guns. The next day, wounded Tibetans who were being treated at Gyanse warned the British that some form of attack was likely. Many Tibetans were not loyal to the Lamas who had ordered them to fight the British. Major Murray dispatched a mounted patrol to reconnoitre the land around Gyanse, but he found nothing. At dawn the next morning, the storm burst, recalled young husband. I was suddenly awakened by shots and loud booming close to my tent. I dashed out, and there were Tibetans firing through our own loopholes only a few yards off. 800 Tibetans had marched through the night from Shigatse and assaulted the British position at 4.30am, just as dawn broke. 
They attempted to rush the British post, a substantial house with a garden at one side, the wall of which the British had loopholed. The Tibetan attack was almost successful. They as nearly as possible forced an entrance but were stoutly held at bay by two gallant little Gurkha sentries till our men turned out. Young husband, still clad in his pyjamas and half asleep, rushed to the citadel, the place from which the British had decided to make a last stand, though he later felt rather ashamed. Personally, I did not deserve to get through the attack unscathed. The first thought that struck me was to go to the rendezvous, agreed upon beforehand, in what we called the citadel. But I ought, as I did on other occasions, and as I think always should be done in cases of any sudden attack, to have made straight for the wall with whatever weapon came to hand, and joined in repelling the attack from the first crucial moments. The British quickly turned the tables against the large Tibetan force. As at Guru, once the single favourable moment had flashed by, nothing but disaster lay before them, noted young husband. The battle ended at 6.30 a.m., and approximately 250 Tibetans were killed or wounded. Major Murray immediately pursued the retiring Tibetans two miles down the road to Shigatse, before another large body of enemy troops fired on his party. Murray and young husband realised that Gyanse was besieged. Murray, with the assistance of the sapper officer Captain Ryder, reinforced the British position during the day. The British garrison amounted to only 170 men. Nighttime attacks were expected, for the British lost the advantage that their long-range modern rifles gave them once darkness had fallen. They fired a good deal during this and the following nights, recorded young husband, but we kept a good watch, and we heard afterwards that the Lamas tried to organise a second attack on us, but the men refused to turn out. On the 6th of May, Colonel Brander had successfully cleared Karala Pass, but the battle had hung in the balance for a few minutes. The Tibetans were armed with locally made and foreign rifles, and they were concentrated behind the loopholed stone wall that they had constructed across the pass. Word had reached Brander that Gyanse was under attack. To attack such a position at a height of over 16,000 feet above sea level, surrounded with glaciers, and with only a sixth of the numbers opposed to him and with his communications not over safe behind him, Colonel Brander had, in truth, to set his teeth and steel his nerves, noted the official history. In the history of the British Empire, such intestinal fortitude as displayed by Brander and his men when faced by overwhelming enemy forces often was the magic element that led to ultimate victory. Major Rowe and his Gurkhas were ordered to scale the steep hillsides of the gorge and drive the Tibetan defenders who were dug in on the cliffs from their lofty positions and then attack the wall defenders from above. Unfortunately, the weather turned against the British as a howling snow blizzard reduced visibility to just a few feet. Captain Bethune led a frontal assault on the wall, which failed disastrously. Poor Bethune, wrote young husband, a typically steady, reliable and lion-hearted officer was killed. The guns proved absolutely ineffective. Ammunition was none too plentiful. The Gurkhas saved the day. Suddenly they emerged above the wall at 18,000 feet, 2,000 feet higher than the summit of Mont Blanc in Europe. The blizzard blew itself out, and the Nepalese riflemen opened fire down into the packed ranks of enemy soldiers who were holding the wall. The Tibetans panicked and began to run away, until the entire position gave way and the great mass of Tibetan troops fled. Captain Otley and a company of mounted infantry chased them halfway to Lhasa, killing many. On the 7th of May, Major Murray was relieved when Brander's force arrived back at Gyanse. Soon his mounted infantry would be proving their worth against the Tibetans. A party of Tibetan horsemen was spotted sauntering unsupported along the valley out of reach of the British rifles. Twenty mounted infantry under Captain Otley dashed out in pursuit. Another body of Tibetan horsemen descended and attempted to cut Otley off. But Captain Otley was not to be so easily caught. 
wrote the young husband. He suddenly wheeled on to some rising ground, dismounted his men as quick as lightning, and was blazing away at both parties before they could realise what had happened. In a moment, several Tibetans dropped, and the remainder scuttled away as fast as they could. Colonel Brander judged the Zong too difficult to capture with his available artillery and troops. Instead, he harried the surrounding area, clearing villages, demolishing strong points, and maintaining a supply service to the rear. On the 14th of May, the British government, communicating through the Viceroy in India, concluded that recent events made a British advance to Lhasa inevitable. Young husband was told to inform the Chinese Amban that he would give the Dalai Lama another month to send someone to open negotiations at Gyanse, after which he would resume his advance on Lhasa. General MacDonald at Chumbi prepared to support the mission. On the 24th of May, strong reinforcements reached Gyanse, consisting of two powerful 10-pounder mountain guns commanded by Lieutenant Easton, a company of Indian sappers and miners, 50 Sikhs and 20 mounted infantry. One much-appreciated arrival was Captain Shepherd of the Royal Engineers, a brave, resourceful and well-known officer from whom much was expected. On the 26th of May, the command assaulted the strongly built village of Pala, 1,100 yards from the British position. It was well defended, and the British launched a night assault. A few sharp rifle cracks rang out, and soon from the Zong and from the Pala village there was a continuous crackle, with sharp spouts of flame lighting the darkness, recalled young husband. Captain Shepherd dashed up to the wall of a solidly defended house in the village, shot three Tibetans with his revolver, placed a charge of gun cotton, lit the fuse and dashed for cover. Soon after a great explosion was heard, followed by a deadly silence. A breach had been made. Captain O'Connor did the same at another house. Lieutenants Garstin and Walker tried the same tactic against another well-defended property, but the fuse failed and Garstin was killed. A further 11 Indian soldiers were also wounded. Major Peterson, the Sikh pioneers, then stormed the village, house by house, with artillery support. On the 5th of June, the government in India ordered young husband to proceed to Chumbi with an escort of 40 mounted infantry under Major Murray to meet with General MacDonald. At Kungma, a fortified position held by the British, young husband met the garrison that consisted of Captain Pearson and a 100 men from the 23rd Sikh Pioneers. The next morning, young husband found himself under attack. I had risen at 4.30am to make an early start and was just dressed when I heard that peculiar jackal-like yell which the Tibetans had used when they made their attacks on Gyanse. I instantly dashed onto the roof and there, sure enough, was a mob of about 300 of them weighing down upon the post and before our men were out they were right up to the walls hurling stones and firing at me up on the roof. We all, dressed or undressed, dashed to the walls, seizing the first rifles we could find and firing away as hard as we could, recalled young husband. As before, they suffered terribly for their want of military acumen. Sixty or seventy were killed. The rest were driven off. Strong reinforcements arrived from India, consisting of the rest of the mountain battery under Major Fuller, a wing of the Royal Fusiliers, who were regular British troops, the 40th Pathans, and the 29th Punjabis. On the 26th of June, the reinforcements reached Gyanse after defeating 800 Tibetans at the village and monastery of Niani. MacDonald now had to break up the Tibetan forces that were investing Gyanse. He began by attacking the strong position on a ridge topped by the Tsurchen Monastery and several fortified towers and sangers on the 28th of May. The battle took most of the day. At 5.30pm, the 8th Gurkha Rifles and 40th Pathans stormed the position, well supported by the artillery. One British officer, Captain Gaster, was killed and three others wounded during the assault. Peace feelers were once again extended to the Tibetans. The important Te Lama came to talk to young husband from Shigatse. He was in favour of peace, but wanted the advice of other more senior Lamas. 
the Tongsen Penlop from Bhutan was closely involved in these negotiations, urging the Lamas to stop fighting and come to an understanding with the British. A Dabar was organized under tents, but talks soon broke down. The British now determined to assault and capture the mighty Gyantse Zong. It was built of solid masonry on a precipitous rock rising sheer out of the plain. It was held by at least double and possibly treble our own force, recalled young husband. They were armed, many hundreds of them, with Laza made rifles, which carried over a thousand yards. Tune in next time to see if the British can capture the mighty Gyantse fort and advance to the Tibetan capital, Laza. You have been listening to Slaughter in Shangri-La, The Invasion of Tibet, written and narrated by Mark Felton. For a wide variety of videos on an extraordinarily huge number of military history subjects, please visit my other YouTube channel, Mark Felton Productions, details below. You can also help to support both of my channels at PayPal and Patreon, details again in the description box below. (laughs) 